got this chromosome 2, which used to be chimp 12 and 13. Now, I have no problem, as I just said, with the chromosomes being very, very similar in, uh, in, in chimps and humans in the past, since we look alike anyway. But what evolutionists will say is that what happened was, back in, back in the day when we had a similar number of chromosomes, these things here fused, made one chromosome, that's human chromosome number 2, it's a combination of 12 and 13 from the chimps, there it is now, and it's all beautifully laid out. We can just see that proves evolution. It doesn't. The similarities actually could go easily either way for design or random evolution. The uh, fact that after, after the creation or the evolution of these two species, that the humans fused chromosome 12 and 13, is not a similarity, it's something that happens that shows the species are separate. It doesn't show they were the same or chimps that have the fusion too. So my story is that uh, yes, humans and chimps did once have the same number of chromosomes. Humans had a fusion, but it never did happen. In the chimp line, it's an evidence of not being related, not of being related. So again, like I said, it's, the, uh, it's not the tip of the iceberg we're arguing about, it's how the iceberg got the way it is. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, there isn't evidence for a common ancestor as far as molecular genetics goes. DNA studies have forced the rejection of two of the great missing links that were in the evolution story, Homo erectus, or upright walking man, and Salanthrus chidensis, the Tamai child. Here we see in uh, Newsweek magazine in 2007, DNA makes clear that Homo erectus was almost certainly a dead end and not, as some scientists had argued, our ancestor. Trouble was, Sahelanthrus chidensis, nicknamed to mind, the word for child, lived close to seven million years ago. The genetic data pointing to a chimp human split at least a million years later suggests to my is not the ur hominid, not the first creature ancestral, only humans and not our chimp cousins after all. So that knocks two of the members off the evolutionary family tree, and the other ones have their problems too, but these are the two that had the big problems with the molecular genetics. Now this textbook here, very popular high school biology textbook, does have these two species as missing links. Here you've got the uh, Sahelanthrus chadensis, recent hominid discovery. The book was published in 2006. Here you have Homo erectus, also mentioned as a missing link to humans, and yet the Washington Post knows that uh, these were not human ancestors. The book even has a little part where the students can pick which of the stories of evolution they think is really true. The only difference is Australopithecus africanus is not listed in this one, but uh, Homo erectus is in both of them, and of course, as we just found out, Homo erectus is, because of the DNA, not a human ancestor. DNA studies have forced the acceptance of unlikely separate evolution of specific traits. It turns out the uh, way that uh, uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary paradigm scientists interpret the DNA structure of bats, for instance, uh, forces them to say that echolocation evolved at least twice on two separate occasions as much of a lightning strike hopeful thing that was to happen just once. Also, DNA studies have forced the acceptance of repeated evolution, then de-evolution of specific traits. And this goes against evolutionary uh, principles. This is the uh, uh, Phasma gigas, a foot-long walking stick insect. And uh, it says here in the Science News that stick insects may have done what biologists once thought was impossible, lose something as complicated as a wing in the course of evolution, but recover it millions of years later. Says uh, Brigham, let's see, that's not supposed to happen with so called complex traits, at least according to a long reigning view of evolution, which is Dallow's principle, says uh, uh, Michael Whitting of Brigham Young University. Yet that's the story revealed by the new family tree based on DNA data from 37 species of sick, uh, stick insects reported in uh, uh, 2003 Nature magazine. At the top of the DNA tree, wings appeared, seeming to have re-evolved at least four times on four different occasions. The wings popped back into the, uh, into the, the scene uh, via accidental evolution uh, up to, after up to 50 million years of winglessness. And it's the DNA studies, it's not like if you were an evolutionary theorist, an evolutionary mechanic, a theorist, that you would want to say these kind of things, or want to see these kind of things. It's where their way of interpreting DNA has led them and must lead them. 
Again, Dr. Feynman saying science has a long history of learning how not to fool ourselves. Um, I'm finding evolutionists are, are uh, moving away from hard data, uh, going to more numerical uh, data, going to more highly complex mathematical models rather than actual hard science. Um, I uh, did attend the lecture of John Beatty also recently here at OU and he said, if outcomes are chance, then maybe the laws are chance too. The laws of evolution could have turned out differently. And once they say the laws evolve, we'll realize those aren't the laws. The laws of nature, thought, comes from a time when science and religion were closer. We might have moved beyond the laws of nature. And of course, if, if a paradigm moves beyond established laws of nature and says it is above those laws, well then of course you can say anything. And uh, then I do think that we are not heeding <coughs> Richard Feynman's <coughs> uh, admonition to not fool ourselves. So that's what I had to say about molecular genetics and not supporting human evolution. Thank you. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. Um, I'd really like to thank the pastor for arranging this for us. Um, I really don't get a lot of opportunities to have these kinds of science outreach opportunities. And I'd really like to because I know in Oklahoma there's a lot of contention between evolution and creation. And I think part of that is a lot of the general public doesn't understand why scientists get so worked up about evolution. Because, I mean, to the general public it's all, it could be like an amoeba evolving into a frog, evolving to a chicken, evolving into people millions of years ago. Why, why is this such a big deal? Well, I use evolution every day in the laboratory in two ways. The first, um, I think some of you would call in a microevolutionary sense. I study the evolution of HIV in the hopes of creating a vaccine that will eliminate that uh, epidemic from this planet. And I also study it in a different way. Some, some of you might call it the macroevolutionary sense. And I do that in hopes of curing cancer or preventing cancer. So this isn't just about abstract things that happened millions and millions of years ago. It's a tool that scientists need in the lab to help people. So what do I mean when I say evolution? Okay, all I mean is descent with modification. So you're different from your parents, and they're different from their parents, and so on and so on and so on. That's it. If you carry that back far enough, you come to the exact same conclusion as Charles Darwin did 150 years ago. And that is that all organic beings have descended from one primordial form. And this was 150 years ago when we didn't have the technology that we have today. And he had this really cool drawing um, in one of his notebooks that actually recapitulates what we do in the laboratory when we're comparing one organism's genetic code to another organism's genetic code. So his insight really was astounding for the time. But how do we make trees like this? Like Mr. Jackson said, we can compare things that we have in common with other organisms. One of those things is the Pax 6 gene. So over the course of time, uh, as the eye was evolving, this particular regulatory gene can be found in people, in mice, in birds, in fish, in insects, to the point where you can actually take a Pax6 gene out of a mouse, put it into the fly's genome, and you get a normal fly with a normal eye. So we have things in common with other organisms. So to a scientist, we look at this and think, well, we had a common ancestor, and that gene got passed on from generation to generation to generation. But, like Mr. Jackson said, does that really support common descent? Because if you have a toddler playing with Legos, she can make a spaceship from that set of Legos, she can make a castle, she can make a dinosaur. If she's using the same building blocks to create different things, I mean, that doesn't mean that the castle is related to the spaceship. 